Okay. Speaker took off. <laughs> <laughs> Must be because he saw the worms I'm about to eat. Oh. <laughs> okay. Shall we begin once again? Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and a happy Sabbath. Uh, in Psalms 95, verse 1 through 7, we're told, Oh, come, let's sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. His hand of the deep place of the earth, the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And of course, one of the commandments, the fourth one to be precise is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, those within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Okay. Okay. Ready. All right. So I shall begin now. And Keith. Oh, it's Keith. Yes. Next week, Christian. You're July 2. <laughs> okay, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us today. Guiding every, everybody as we prepare for the time of trouble that is soon to come upon us, a time of trouble that we have never seen before, and it'll be the worst time of trouble ever. Uh, prepare us for this here event that will soon be upon us. In your name, amen. Okay, today we're going to talk about a time of trouble such as there never has been before. And that comes from a text in uh, Daniel 12.1. Um, well, and then we're going to go, th we're first going to go through uh, quotes by Mrs. White that will prepare us for this. And then we're going to go through two examples of what this possibility could be and the threats we have of them happening today. Um, one of the second one, I'll just touch on briefly because I've done a presentation uh, years ago on it. And then the third thing we're going to go and I'm going to show some screenshots from Randy's memorial last weekend for those who was not there. And then on the fourth thing, we uh, I sent out on our email yesterday uh, a uh, article from the recorder. And um, when we get to it, we'll go over a little bit over that article and then a presentation that I did. It's like the person that did this article had read my presentation almost. But it came out just this week. So a time of trouble such as there has never been before. From garrets, from hovels, from dungeons, from scaffolds, from mountains and deserts, from the caves of the earth, from the caverns of sea, Christ will gather his children to himself. On earth they have been destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Millions have gone down to the grave loaded with infamy because they refuse to yield to the deceptive claims of Satan. 
You see, that is what we have to be doing each and every day, refusing to yield to the deceptive claims of Satan. By human tri tribunals, the children of God have been adjudged the vilest criminals. That means that we have been accused of the worst things possible. But the day is near when God is judge himself. Psalms 50, verse 6. Then, what, when is then? What time will this happen? Then, that's when we have been accused of the vilest criminals. The decisions of earth will be reversed. The rebuke of his people shall he take away. White robes will be given to every one of them. And they shall call them the holy people the redeemed of the Lord. And that's from Christ's obvious lessons, and that is a promise. <clears throat> Continuing, poverty is coming upon this world, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. There will be wars and rumors of wars, and we'll briefly we'll talk about rumors of wars later. And the faces of men will gather paleness. You may have to suffer distress. You may go hungry sometimes, but God will not forsake you in your suffering. And why will that be? Because he has claimed us. As Abel says earlier, he has bought us with a price. But he will test your faith. Now, as we go back into the Old Testament, did he test the faith of the leaders back then? Yes, he did. He will test your faith. We are not to live to please ourselves. That there tells us what some of these testing of the faith will be. When you go back at the top, poverty, that's one of them. We are here to manifest Christ to the world to represent him and his power to mankind. And that there, when people look at us, they should see Christ in us. Yeah, I'm still working on that. That's from manuscript 37, and it's also from the book Evangelism. Time to rely on God's word in the wilderness when all means of sustenance fail. God sends his people manna from, his, from heaven and a sufficient and constant supply was given. This provision was to teach them that while they trusted in God and walked in his ways, he would not forsake them. And we are also to remember that as we go into the time of trouble. As long as we trust in them, our basic needs will be supplied. If I had a vision and meeting, many would say that it was excitement and that someone mesmerized me. Then I would go away alone in the woods there where no eye or ear but God could see or hear and pray to him. And he would sometimes give me a vision there. I then rejoiced and told them what God had revealed to me alone, where no mortal could influence me. But I was told by some that I mesmerized myself. Oh, I thought, oh, thought I, has it come to this that those who honestly go to God alone to plead his promises and to claim his salvation are to be charged with being under the foul and soul damning influence of mesmerism? Now, there it tells you exactly if you're under mesmerism what it exactly is does to you. Now, what is mesmerism? This is from dictionary.com. Mesmerized, mesmerizing means to hypnotize. Now, for many years, some of you know, for 10 years, I went to the International UFO Congress, and there, there was people that believed in hypnotism. And uh, I did not know before then that people believed in it. Let's uh, continue to see what else she says about mesmerism. These things wounded my spirit and wrung my soul in keen, keen anguish, well nigh to despair. 
while many would have me believe that there was no Holy Ghost and that all the exercises that holy men of God had experienced were only mesmerism or the deceptions of Satan. She there says that hypnotism is a deception of Satan directly. Now, at the time of the end, while well, we see visions and dream dreams, Joel 2, 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So I believe that also at the time of trouble that we will be accused of the same things that Mrs. White was accused of. <clears throat> God revealed these heirs to me in vision and sent me to his erring children to declare them. But many of them wholly rejected the message and charged me with conforming to the world. On the other hand, the nominal evidence charged me with fanaticism, and I was falsely and by some wickedly represented as being the leader of the fanaticism that I was actually laboring to correct. Different times were repeatedly set for the Lord to come and were urged upon the brethren. Have we not had this same thing happen today as people setting dates? Happens all the time. But the Lord showed me that they would all pass by, that's those dates, for the time of trouble must come before the coming of Christ and that every time that was set, and past will only weaken the faith of God's people. And I have said that numerous times, that when you set dates and they don't come forth, that it doesn't occur then, that it makes those people not have faith in Christ and his promises. But you see, there is a time of trouble that is coming. And we're going to talk some more about the possibilities of what that could be involved with. All these things weighed heavily upon my spirits. What was that? This is a messerism. And in the confusion, I was sometimes tempted to doubt my own experience. See, we, aren't, we don't talk about Mrs. White having doubt. While at family prayers one morning, the power of God began to rest upon me. And the thought rushed into my mind that it was mesmerism or hyp hypnosis. And I resisted it. Immediately, I was struck dumb and for a few moments was lost to everything around me. I then saw my sin in doubting the power of God. Have we ever doubted the power of God? I know I have. And that for so, so doing, I was struck dumb and that my tongue would be loosed in less than 24 hours. And that is from early writings, page 21. After I came out of my vision, I beckoned to the slate and wrote upon it that I was dumb. Also what I had seen and that I wished the large Bible, I took the Bible and readily turned to all the texts I had been, that I had seen upon the card. When she was in this vision, she was showing a card with all these texts on it. And this is what she presented to the, the people there afterwards. But she had to write it on a slate to say that she was done because they didn't know. I was unable to speak all day. Early the next morning, my soul was filled with joy and my tongue was loosed to shout the high praises of God. After that, I dared not doubt or for a moment resist the power of God, however others might think of me. In other words, she didn't worry about, they can make accusations against her all they want because she knew where these came from and that it was not mesmerism or hypnosis, but that it was from the power of God. Okay, now we're going to compare this with the experience of Zacharias. <coughs> this comes from Luke 1, 17 to 22. 
And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that's kind of what we're doing today, trying to make a people ready. And Zacchaeus said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered on, uh, said on him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. See, it happened to him because he didn't believe also, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacchaeus and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remain speechless. And he shall go before them in the spirit and power of Elias. This is the father of John the Baptist, talking about John the Baptist. The spirit and power of Elias. In other words, he is not Elias, but he is in the spirit and power of Elias. To turn the hearts and the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, are we told that this same thing is going to happen? Yes, we are. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. You see, this is the same message that John the Baptist had, that Elias had, and that is to turn the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, I'm going to have some quotes from the 1884 version of the Great Controversy before it was changed. It is also called Volume 4, The Spirit of Prophecy. And for the people that's on my email list, a couple days ago on one of my emails, I sent this version to you because there is some sections <coughs> in there that is very, very interesting. This is page 411. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is how much light in them? No light in them. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard. Now, as we go into this time of trouble, we're going to see that it's the scriptures that is going to be our safeguard, and it will be our only safeguard to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Now, is it talking about out of the church? I believe it's talking about inside the church as well. Page 411. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, which testimony? That's the Holy Scriptures testimony. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. The Apostle Paul declared, looking down to the last days, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This, uh, that time has fully come. Now, this was in 1884. Back in 1884, they would not endure sound doctrine. Just look at what it is like today. Sound doctrine. There is no, you look out there in a non-spiritual work, there is no sound doctrine. It's all deception. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology. And towards the end, we will look again at that. 
to professors of theology as their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. What is their duty? They won't find it from the professors of theology. They will find that their duty to Christ in the scriptures. And that is on page 413. And I put this under as an example of refusing the feast statutes. The spirit which actuated these priests and rulers is still manifested by many who make a high profession of piety. They refuse to examine the scripture, the testimony of the scriptures concerning the truths for this time. Now, what was we talking about in 1884? We was just talking about that they have a different, uh, they believe differently because they will refuse to examine the scriptures. And when you, when you come across somebody that refuses to be a feast keeper, they do not refer to the testimonies of the scriptures. They will refer to one of their intellectuals who has written a book on the subject or has reinterpreted the scriptures. And his fearful denunciations of the scribes and Pharisees and his warning to the people not to follow these blind leaders were placed on record as an admonition to future generations. That is us, blind leaders. Ignorance of God's word is sin. When every provision has been made that we may become wise. So when God comes through the Holy Spirit and tells you that you must do this or you must do that and you refuse, it is a sin. That's an ignorance to his, uh, his God's word, which he has directly led you into your beliefs. That's page 416 page 425. But many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. The popular minister, like the Pharisees of old, are filled with anger as their authority is questioned. Have you ever had somebody today that got upset when you questioned their authority, when their authority does not come from the scriptures, but it comes from a university or, or some other place? They are filled with anger as their authority is questioned. They denounce the message as of Satan and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. And I'm telling you that this will be fulfilled again in the very near future. Mrs. White tells us, the Bible tells us this all the time. In fact, they would ask Christ, by whose authority? And he's always referred back to his father. The clergy put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. This has happened back then with Christ, but his light still shined. This was also will happen during the, the uh, time of trouble when there will, will be, it says almost super, I say it will be superhuman efforts to shut us up. But, you know, we must present God's light to shine. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. So, the apostates, who is that? That's people from among us will come and be our worst um, instigators of false reports and accusations. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who are blessed with its light were tempted and tried. 
he commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. That's us. He has commanded us to present this last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the pearl of their own souls. They cannot remain silent. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with a holy concentration hasten from place to place to proclaim the warnings from heaven. You see, at the time of the end, we're going to be going from place to place, to city to city, to village to village, to town to town, to different countries. We're not going to be sitting here in our house doing nothing. We're going to be out proclaiming this warning, this warning to heaven. And that's going to be the three angels' messages. And let's go back to the Daniel 12, 1. And at that, which is what this here presentation was about. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. That time, thy people shall be delivered. Now, as I have presented before, you think that could be on a day of atonement? Just a thought, I uh, uh, brought that up here before. When he, and this is what Ellen White talks about this here. And when he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. So this is when he leaves the sanctuary. And the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Now you wonder what we're being trained for today. We are being trained so that we can live in the sight of God without an intercessor. The power attending the last warning has enraged them. What's his power? What was his power? This warning. This warning has that we just have read previously. Uh, a couple of them back. This power of the last warning has been engaged to men, and their anger is kindled against all who have received this message. This was the last message that goes to them, and they are angered because of it. The people of God are plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time <coughs> of Jacob's trouble. And, you know, it's... Very interesting. Maybe I'll do a study on uh, Jacob's trouble sometime because it's very interesting what started Jacob's trouble and um, the what the outcome was. Be because of the deception practice and secured his to secure his father's blessing intended for Esau, Jacob had fled for his life, alarmed by his brother's deadly threats. So Esau was coming after Jacob, and Jacob, that's when he had the fight with the angel. On reaching the borders of the land, he was filled with terror by the tidings of Esau's approach at the head of a band or warriors, doubtless bent on revenge. Uh, he made a mistake, and now he was going to try to make it right. So should the followers of Christ, as they approach the time of trouble, make every exertion 
to place himself in a proper light before the people, to disarm prejudice, and to avert the dangers which threaten liberty of conscience, <coughs> which will be the Sunni law. We are to disarm prejudice. In other words, is it a possibility that some of the problems that we have, we are bringing upon ourselves to disarm the prejudice? We must place ourselves in the proper light before the people. Satan has accused Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of his sin. He had moved upon Esau to march against him. So why was Esau coming at Jacob? Because Satan led him to it. And during the patriarch's long night of wrestling, Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. Now you see a direct relationship between the, Jake, the fight that Jacob had with the type of, with us at the time of the end, when Satan will try to discourage us by showing us you are guilty, guilty, guilty. Now, <coughs> this here, this here uh, today is uh, talking about the time of trouble. And I'm going to go through a bunch of pictures. There's a bunch of him uh, the, about the nuclear threat. And um, I believe that it's uh, this era has been preparing. Uh, the nuclear threat has been preparing uh, the other side for a nuclear holocaust on this planet. And we're going to go through about 20 or so slides showing their testing that they have. And then the second part will be objects from the sky that are pounding the earth. And I did a presentation uh, quite some time ago called Planet Crossing. I'll just briefly talk about it. But it, this area is mostly going to be about the, the nuclear. And then I'll show you there's a, a newspaper article that talks about it, uh, just to show the headlines of it. July 16, 1945, Trinity. It was an atomic bomb, 21 kilotons. And to me, this is Satan preparing people against the devices of God. The little boy, August 6, 1945. Batman, August 9, 1945. You know, these are all testing to perfect their weapons. This was Baker. Uh, July 25, 1946, 21 kilotons. And they didn't want people to know about it then. This isn't secret anymore. But Operation Sandstone, nuclear explosions, 1948. Scientific Director's Report, Volume 1, General Report. And that was done at the ENEWETAK Proving Grounds. I believe that was on an island. X-ray, April 15, 1948. Yoke, May 1, 1948. Then on August 29, 1949, the first Soviet atomic bomb was went, went off. And this is the only one that I talk about any other country outside of the United States that, that, that does it. This is uh, called Ranger Abel. <laughs> and this is came back to uh, over at the uh, um, 1951, a year before I was born. The first that nation in the United States since the Trinity went off because they've been doing it on some islands. Project Easy. 
This is structural effects test. This was done on an, <coughs> one of the small islands where they went and put a whole bunch of buildings up and then they blew this uh, atomic bomb up. Then they went in afterwards to uh, study the effects that it had on buildings. Item 1951, first test of the boostering principle. And you see there's the lines that come, coming up from there. On some of those explosions, this here happened. And they used this new technique where they could double the effects of the atomic explosions. Ivy Mike, first full scale hydrogen bomb. Gravel, 1953, the atomic cannon, which is what this one was called. Castle Bravo, 1954, the largest United States thermonuclear device up to that point. As you can see the big, huge mushroom cloud that is there. Now we'll go to some general uh, operations. This was Operation Red Wing, Pacific Proving Ground. They did 17 different nuclear tests. This was in this project. It wasn't just one, there was 17 in this project. Cherokee, first aircraft delivered H bomb by the United States, 1956. Shortly, <coughs> I was born in 52, so I was like four years old then. Operation Plum Bob, Nevada test site. I've been out there many times. They did 24 nuclear tests. And it was in that same time frame back in the 1950s. Operation Hardtack, Pacific Proving Grounds. And I believe that was on some of those islands out there. 35 different nuclear tests. Frygate Bird. Polaris missile test, yield, it's still classified. We don't know how big it was. Swordfish, it's an anti-submarine weapon test, yield classified. So this one I believe was done in the water or underneath the water. And it, uh, they had different submarines out there and then they studied the submarines afterwards to see what effect that it would have upon submarines. Between 1945 <coughs> and 1962, the United States conducted 331 atmospheric nuclear tests. Now, why do I say this here? Because very, very recently, within the last two weeks, Russia says Ukraine could go nuclear if West kept, keeps sending weapons. And there was another article that talked about the West Coast of the United States would be where that they would use this nuclear device. Another article said West and East Coast. So are we, are we uh, amping up to see one of these nuclear devices being used very soon? I have said that the Ram and the Higo and a future application of it with Iran, that it's going to be a nuclear, uh, a nuclear weapon will be used. But then I've also says we will have to wait and see. So the Pope has to chime in on this also. Pope Francis, a world free of nuclear weapons is necessary and possible. And then you see this here is the, uh, um, the first meeting of states parties in Vienna. This was uh, June 21 to 23. When was that? Well, gee, that was just, just this last week. Re very recent. So what is this here? I believe it's a partial answer to a, a fulfillment of this. Mark 13, 7, and when ye shall hear of wars, 
We have uh, here a war between Russia and Ukraine and rumors of wars. And that there is because numerous people have been talking about wars, China, India, Pakistan, different nations. Be ye not troubled for such things needs to be, but the end shall not be yet, but it's coming soon. And this is the second opinion. See, the first we've talked about nuclear, which I hadn't talked really that much about before. But the second, here's what Mrs. White says about it. Whole rivers will be dried up. The earth will be convulsed and there will be dreadful eruptions and earthquakes everywhere. Have we seen dreadful eruptions, volcanoes? Yes, we have. And earthquakes everywhere. I get just about everywhere, over in the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Just a few days ago, there was a, a, about a 6.0, some say 5.9, some say 6.1, where there was over 1,000 people killed and over 1,500 people injured, way out in no place. God will plague the wicked, the wicked inhabitants of the earth until they are destroyed from off it. This is by Mrs. White. Who will plague the wicked? It, will it be Satan? It says God will plague the wicked inhabitants of the earth until they are destroyed from off it. This is called the results of the judgment. The saints are preserved in the earth in the midst of these dreadful commotions as Noah was preserved in the ark of the time of the flood. And uh, see, Noah, the preservation of Noah is an example for, for us if we follow God and do his commandments, statutes, and judgments. <coughs> and um, on the one that I did before, uh, NASA warns of an extension level asteroid strike. And they've been um, off and on, they come up with this here, and they said that we're going to be hit again. And then they will back off. And it's kind of like they know it's coming, but when is it coming? See, these here are attacks from the outside. The nuclear is attacks from within. And this here is a good example of what is going on on the planet today. This I mentioned to Sandy earlier that, um, um, that I have this text. Woe unto them that call good evil and that call evil good and good evil. That puts darkness for light and light for darkness. That puts bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you look around at the news today, they everywhere, good is called evil. Evil is called good. They look at one crime and say, well, that's nothing. And then they look at another crime and they says, that is the worst thing that could ever happen. That is calling good. That is calling evil good and good evil. And then people say, well, you can't get instructions from the Holy Scriptures. This will put that in light very clearly. And this is by, uh, I get emails from these, this guy uh, all the time, Michael. I can't pronounce his last name. When the lie becomes the truth. Have you seen that today? When the lie becomes the truth, there is no moving backwards. In other words, it's like fact-checking. This lie is now truth. They did this way back with creation. It started out as a theory, and then it became their truth, and they taught it in the schools, and they still are. When the lie becomes the truth. Now we're going to go to uh, Randy's memorial, <coughs> and I'm going to show you some pictures of Randy's memorial. Because I know some people uh, was not able to uh, be on Zoom with it. 
This is Randy at uh, Bible Explorations, one of my favorite places I used to visit, blowing the uh, shofar. And of course, this here uh, memorial, it was all about music. Here's a song this gentleman is singing. His name is Wonderful. Here they're singing and playing uh, Blessed Assurance. And this is a kid by the name of Zacchaeus. Lord, I am coming home. This is Justin singing, He is Alive. And Justin, I believe, was uh, Randy's and Karen's son, although I've never met their family except for the two of them. Okay, now yesterday, oh, this has gone faster than I thought it would. Yesterday, I sent out an article about the recorder, and this is the front page of the recorder. Um, let me get my copy here. This is for June of 2.22. And we're specifically, there was an article in it and I sent it to people, it's on my email list. And the article is coping or not coping with change. And if uh, people remember a number of years ago, I did a, a PowerPoint plan, a thing at Bible Exploration and it was called Probation for Us and the Church. And it was uh, had dealt with Robert Pearson when he had become the General Conference president and some of the problems that he encountered during that. And uh, the focus was not on him, but it was about the things that had been set in place. Um, Here's the things that they talked about in this article. Creeping liberalism. New kind of Avenist, which is called intellectuals. You think Mrs. White had something to say about that? Christian had some of his, uh, in some of his quotes recently also about it. New views on heavenly sanctuary. Not talked about in this year is the harmonics or the trinity none of those two things was talked about but i have a couple of things that um that i put in mind and we're going to relook at them here and this was under probation for us in the church <coughs> now these are by uh, these are quotes by Raymond Cottrell. Um, and he was one of them that we didn't, uh, some of these things that, are, that happened that I talked about before, we would have not known about it had it not been from Raymond Cottrell. Now, he was involved in a secret Bible uh, study conference back in the 1960s. And it was actually labeled secret. And uh, these here are from, uh, from an article from PUC that I got. And it all deals with Pearson when he tried to set the, set the, and stop some of this thing coming into our church. After 30 years of work overseas as a missionary in 1966, he came back to North America. And that's, this is Pearson. But his lifetime of service overseas proves to be a severe handicap when he returned to the General Conference headquarters. For most of his life, he was out of touch with the Church of North America. Now, who is he out of touch with? Actually, he was not out of uh, touch with the church. He was out of touch with the intellectuals, the people with the new theology. He experienced considerable difficulty in understanding and relating to changes 
that had taken place during his absence. This was especially true with respect to the corporate biblical theological doctrine process of the church at the general conference level. Now you notice this here is a, the, a biblical theological doctrinal process. This is a process. And um, it's like he had no idea at first what he was dealing with. But during Elder Pearson's absence, church administrators had come to rely on <coughs> a new generation of trained and experienced Bible scholars. And we're going to look at a quote by Mrs. White at the end of this, what she says about this. A new generation of trained and experienced Bible scholars as their brethren of experience in such manners. And he very sincerely believed that the Bible scholars, with their historical method of Bible study, were leading the church astray. <coughs> and when you go back and look at the, some of the quotes that I have back then, what they talk about William Miller, they left Mrs. White alone, but they went all around Mrs. White. But they keyed on William Miller, that they were leading the church astray. It was his implementation that the policy that to this day had made it difficult for church administrators and Bible scholars to work together in a spirit of mutual understanding and confidence. In other words, for the common good, as they had been doing prior to his administration. Implementing his policy, Elder Pearson appointed two administrators without training or experience in Bible study on the research level to be in charge of the General Conference Office of Biblical Research and the Biblical Research Community. That there became known as the BRI. Elder Pearson fired all those people. It didn't say this in this article, but he fired them and put his own people in there that was not the highly critical theological people that uh, Ted Gunderson, or that Ted um, uh, Schultz talks about. <coughs> On April 3, 1969, the spring meeting of the General Conference removed the Bible scholars in mass from the Biblical Research Committee, now the BRI, and staffed it with administrators. A vigorous protest by the seminary facility forestalled implementation of the plan, but a similar effect was achieved a few months later by adding a large number of administrators and other non-scholars to the existing committee. This was by Raymond Cottrell, and this was an article was from PUC. I don't have that article anymore, but Raymond Cottrell was one of those peoples that he was coming up against. And I was very shocked to see this in, in this, uh, in this uh, article in the review. Now, let's see what Mrs. White, and this is one of them that I have in my PowerPoint that I had for years, years ago. In the future, Deception of every kind is to arise. How many kinds of every kind is to arise? And we want solid ground for our feet. That's the, called the foundations. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. Who established them? The Lord has established the enemy will bring in false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. That is exactly what he came up, was coming up against, uh, Elder Pearson was coming up against as the general conference president. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. You see, when you believe that there is no sanctuary, you are departing from the faith. Is, is that clear? Where shall we find safety unless it be from the truths that the Lord has been giving 
for the last 50 years. Well, this is in uh, 1905. So now we can say over 100 years. And I think that Is it 1139? Well, that's not too bad. I had a whole bunch of pictures in there and I thought it would take longer. But that, perfect, that what I gave before that um, the probation for us and the church was very interesting. This article, there's things in there that it did not mention, which I mentioned in my PowerPoint and which Raymond Cottrell mentioned in his articles that they did not put in there. And I believe the reason that they didn't put him in there, he wanted to continue working and it wouldn't have been put in if they would have put everything in there. It was really interesting. <laughs> um, hey, Lindy, you can sit in my recliner in there and watch TV. You can sit in my recliner in my room and watch. Yeah, I have my TV in our recliner. And you can sit there. Keith, it was very interesting what you were putting uh, there about Bro, Raymond yeah. Cottrell and how uh, nice big his chair. lifetime of service overseas actually was a handicap to him. And then when he returns, uh, you know, he just sees everything completely shifted, everything changed. And it makes you wonder. Because we're so used to, well, at least me, you know, I came into Adventism in 2009. So it makes you wonder how it was every generation kind of sliding away from the truth. What was the primitiveness of early Adventism like that maybe a lot of us, well, of course, we just haven't seen? Well, we used to be known as the, the people of the book because we depended completely on the scriptures. And now they don't depend completely. Oh, they'll quote scriptures, but then they use these, uh, as Ted Schultz says, these other higher critiques to critique them to show that they have newer, uh, newer ideas on it. Mm -hmm. You see, this is what Pearson had huge problems with back in the 1960s. And he went and tried to change it. And uh, he didn't, you know, he was like, got hit by a sledgehammer. You know, he didn't realize what hit. But you see, some of the, uh, Christian, have you heard about the meeting in uh, the 1960s? It was uh, a secret I might conference. have, I don't, but I don't recall. There was a secret conference on the book, of, uh, on Daniel 8. Okay. And they was trying to do away with, with it. The sanctuary sure. message. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, um, the only reason we know about it, it was 25, there was 25 uh, top theological uh, people who was involved. We know because uh, Cottrell was one of them. Wow. And he came out and he talked about it at a speech before he died in Loma Linda. And I had uh, two cassettes of that whole sermon at one time. I don't have them anymore. And he went through in depth of... Um, of their new view of the sanctuary does not mean what we think it means. Wow. You know, it's interesting in Ezekiel chapter eight, when all those abominations are being seen by Ezekiel, it says he saw <laughs> about, it says 25 men. Yeah. Uh, and they were, I think it says that they were worshiping uh, the images in, in secret. And it was just, I thought, wow, you know. So when you say 25, I'm like, well, that's pretty serious. There was, there was 25. And uh, it, was, it was quite, it was quite interesting because in this, when I put in uh, the probation for us in the church, I brought, you know, I had a bunch of other quotes in there. And one of them was uh, Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford has this uh, thing on, uh, it's on YouTube, or at least it used to be, Bye Bye Sanctuary. You know, he was very clear about it. And the, the technique that he used was what he referred to as permatics. 
And I have a quote in the other one talking about in with when you use hermetics, you cannot prove any of our historical documents or, or a lot of our uh, historical uh, doctrines. Yeah, hermeneutics definitely twists uh, twists things all around, and that's like that's in the university. That's like the first thing that the the upcoming pastors learn, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's based it's Bible. based on um on 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 Greek linear thinking, and then uh, the Romans took it up as well. Thomas Aquinas. If you go back there, that's where the crux lies. That three hundred years <laughs> after Christ. Um, you know, the, we, we, we seem to focus, if you read the, the Bible commentary and stuff like that as well, there's certain things that Adventists have just looked at and highlighted. But if you look at the whole history for the first, say, 1,300 years uh, after Christ, they, you, you, you see there is so much more to that. We've just got the, the skeleton here. And like you say, the hermeneutics around it was developed by Catholics. Um, and that's why even with, with Ellen White and so on, they use those concepts. That's what's still being taught today at any university that does a, 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 a pastor's degree, a, a theological degree. The first year is theology. It's not Adventism. So yes. it's very interesting. And, and, and so I think I've mentioned it before. Um, yeah, I know specifically people that we have sponsored to go to the local university here, Elderberg, and people were so disillusioned that they dropped out after the first year because of hermeneutics, because it doesn't tie up with what is being taught out there by lay people. And, and this I think is, if this is why Pearson fired the people at the BRI, no. he was trying to you, get rid of that. You know, Pearson, I've got a, a sermon of Pearson where he he does the three angels' message. Okay. A very beautiful, but just do yourselves a favor. Just go search and see how many people <laughs> preach the three angels message. Do a sermon on it. There's literally three or four on the internet. You cannot find them. I, and I'm talking people in the church, not outside, in the church. And Pearson was one of them. I actually have that DVD. I used to sell it in my shop. Okay. It is one of the most stunning things you can listen to, but one of the least promoted things within Adventism, <coughs> Pearson doing the Three Angels message. Um, no. There's two books. There's literally two books that's been written in the last, well, let's say last 12, 15 years on the Three Angels message. Two. Well, but go go read about all the other stuff, tons of it. When, when you go to this article, it starts about talking that he came up against people, men with beards. Mm. That has nothing to do with it. What Pearson was came up against. Yeah, yeah. It's trying to divert that attention away. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm off to bed, folks. It's nine o'clock, or quarter to nine. Yes, Sandy. Looks like you're having a wonderful time there. Your house looks so lovely. And Ed and Linda, please, you know, come rather come visit me in South Africa before you move to a prison. Okay, we do have proper <laughs> huts here with grass. And I can give you some spare worms if you need with onions. They are vegan <laughs> worms. Okay. Go so please read what their content is. They are high in magnesium and other minerals. Okay. You Thank folks you have well. a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. Uh, all right. Bye, bye. Thank you all. And we'll have Dave and Christian next week. And um, we'll see most of you for Wednesday. I know Ed Linda will be on the road. So, anyway, Dave, Dave, can you have closing prayer? Big pardon? Can you have closing prayer? Oh, sure. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we've had so much information, so many things to think about, to dwell over, to <coughs> understand uh, what's coming to us, and what we need to be do to be ready when your Son Yeshua comes to take us home in the clouds of glory. So. Be with each and every one. Keep them safe. Uh, thank you for another blessed Sabbath day. So be with us. Keep us safe and uh, and uh, take all the concern out of our hearts. So thank you so much. In your son Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. I know a lot of you know her before I cut it off. Um, 
you knew Patricia Robertson, and she passed away June 18. I did not know that. Uh, no, that a lot of you, some of you might not have known her, but I know she was getting weaker, and they said probably any time, and I just saw it posted. So that's another good one. She used to come down to our camp meeting. Yeah. So, all right, you guys, we will see you um, Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Bye, y'all. Yeah. Bye.